lives. Our individual mediation experiences have shown that relationships matter, and when we respond to conflict with deep listening and without judgment, amazing shifts can happen between people. Our hardcore research has shown that these shifts impact complex social issues, such as decreasing recidivism, and our work saves public institutions time and money. This year, Community Mediation Maryland continued to support the grassroots efforts of community mediation centers to provide transformational services, while also advocating to integrate these concepts into public policy. One significant challenge with which our communities are struggling is that of police community relations, which have roots in historical oppression and are impacted by broader economic injustices. Our responses to these problems must be comprehensive and multifaceted. And among the many needed solutions, there is a role for mediation and dialogue. Across the state, Community Mediation Maryland has supported the development of police complaint mediation and police youth dialogues, and has provided facilitation support for collaborative policy development between police and community members. Over the last year, CMM has focused significant efforts on supporting Community Mediation Baltimore to bring collaborative dialogues to these sometimes painful conversations. Tonight, we are honored to have participants from a dialogue that CMM and CMB facilitated in West Baltimore. It took incredible courage and seemingly irrational hope for these individuals to commit to 16 hours of conversation with each other. Now on the other side of that 16 hours, they are scheduling more time to continue their collective efforts, and they have taken time tonight to share some of their experiences with you. Community Mediation Maryland Quality Assurance Director Tracy Four served as a lead facilitator on this project, and she will introduce our guests. Good evening, everyone. So um, this is a real honor. They rarely give me the mic. Um, <laughs> Um, but this, this is the perfect night for it. So I'm here to introduce Marvin McKinstry and Zachary Novak. Um, I'll start with Zachary I met first. I began working on this project at the request of Lord Charcutian. And the first part of having this dialogue with Baltimore City police officers and residents was to try to talk to people in, on, the, on the front end. And um, I'm, y'all have spoiled me over the years. I'm used to calling y'all, and if I don't get you, you call me back, and we chat, and what have you. And so I made lots of calls, and nobody called me back, <laughs> until Zachary. Zachary was the first person to call me back, the first person I got to meet with. And um, in the face of um, his profession, his calling, being in a very difficult time, he was one of the first people that said, yes, yes, this is something that I want to be a part of. Yes, this is something that I want to do. And, you know, we count on him every time to come to the meetings and bring, you know, just plain and honest truth and a bright and shining light of hopefulness to it. And, and I'm so grateful that he is here tonight to kind of talk about that experience and the way that he brings himself fully to the table. You know, Baltimore is the home of keeping it 100, and <laughs> Zachary has done an amazing job of doing that, you know. Um, and then we have Marvin McKinstry. Marvin was um, recruited, he, he came in on the second meeting, and he has not missed a meeting since. And uh, we, and you would know if he's there, there'd be a, a, a black hole in his absence because um, the things that he shares, you know, about his, his relationship with Baltimore, his relationship with Baltimore City Police in the past and currently, and his willingness to, to transform those relationships has been amazing to experience. It has, you know, um, my relationship with collaborative processes has transformed my life, right? And to see a kindred spirit being willing to allow their lives to be transformed in front of people and to talk about 
how impactful that is to his work in his community has been amazing. So, gentlemen, if I can get y'all to come up here and share this. How's everybody doing? Uh, I'm Zachary Novak. I'm a Baltimore City Police Officer. I work in the Western District. I guess to start off with, I'll give a little background about myself, uh, starting with why I became a police officer. I'm sure like most police officers will tell you, they got into the profession because they wanted to help people. Uh, I just graduated from college and I was in the process of getting hired and they called me up and they said, when would you like to uh, start? I said, oh, right away. The sooner the better. They said, all right, come in tomorrow. And I was so excited because I thought, okay, I'm going to start on my road to becoming a police officer. And then for the next two months, I vacuumed elevators, I painted <laughs> on the side, and I swept up the entire headquarters, which is downtown Baltimore, gross. Uh, so I finally got to become a police officer, went through the whole academy, and then I remember they told us what district we were going to go to. And I knew just going through the academy, everybody told me the city's broken up east and west, and those are the two toughest places to work. And so we're all starting to get our districts, and one officer after another is going in, and then I go up, and they say, all right, Zach, Western District. And if you know anything about Baltimore City, east and west are typically the hardest. So I was a little nervous, I was excited, uh, but mostly nervous, because I knew I was about to enter a whole, whole new world for something I'd never experienced before, and I was going to be challenged big, big, big time, and I was going to have to throw out all my preconceived expectations of what I thought I was going to encounter. And I've, I've grown a lot, I've seen a lot, I've done a lot in that time, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. There's nowhere else I'd like to work because I feel like I make the biggest difference every day by being there, and it challenges me the most every day. So fast forward to uh, my initial meeting with Tracy. Before I had even met her, I got a phone call from my major, Major Briscoe. And there's a thing in the police department called a chain of command, which is very strict, you don't break it. Uh, so for example, the only person I might talk to other than my fellow officers is a sergeant. And anytime you hear from someone above your sergeant, it's a bad sign. <laughs> it means you screwed up big. So after a sergeant, there was a lieutenant. And after a lieutenant, there was a captain, and then a major. So to hear from the major, I get a phone call from her. I'm like, oh man, I really, really goofed up somewhere. But she, Thankfully, it wasn't that serious. She told me that uh, there was somebody who wanted to meet us from community mediation and would I be interested. And in the last uh, four years that I've been doing policing, uh, she told me a little bit about it. It was uh, designed to help improve relationships between the community and police in general. And right after the uprising and everything, it was clear to me that something needed to change, but I didn't really need an uprising to tell me that. I'd done it for four years. I saw that the way things were going, the status quo just wasn't working, there was a better way out there, and that if this was an opportunity to get to that better way, I was all game for it. So I remember meeting Tracy, we met in that cafe on Baltimore Street, and she was uh, gung-ho for it, I was gung-ho for it. Uh, and if you don't know about anything else about police officers, we don't answer our phones ever because it's always court telling us that we got to come in. <laughs> so if you get a number that you don't recognize, you let that go to voicemail. <laughs> So I'm going to pass it off to Marvin here, and I'm sure he'll give you some background on his, his work and all about him. Uh, our backgrounds are polar opposites. Uh, my, uh, I moved into the Western District at 10 months old when my mother and father separated into the Lexington Terrace Housing Project. And if you're from Baltimore, then you know um, Lexington Terrace is one of the roughest and meanest places that uh, West Baltimore has ever known. And I lived there most of my life. Um, my first interaction with the Baltimore City Police Department came at about 12. Um, I was under arrest at 12 years old. And this uh, tumultuous way of life kind of continued until I was about 22, 23 years old. Um, and I found myself at a point where I just kind of got tired. I'm talking drug arrest, violent crimes, and just about anything that you can imagine. Um, a young person foolish enough to not fear anything can get into. That was me. But the good thing about it is on the other side of um, getting tired came a passion towards transforming lives in my community. 
So I, um, I got into a lot of activism, kind of doing things my own way, kind of finding people that were like me and trying to make whatever positive change I can. Um, then about a year ago, there was this uh, uprising. And when the uprising happened, I actually sent Tracy some pictures today. I found myself in a very peculiar position because there was the Baltimore City Police, there was me, and then there was residents in my community. Um, one image literally has me with my back in between Baltimore City Police and some citizens. And I went home um, and Keisha was there and I cried like a baby because I didn't understand what we had come to um, that we had that kind of, I mean, it's been brewing for years in our community, brewing for years in our city. What we had come to um, that a person uh, like me who uh, loves their city, loves young people in their city. I work with young people um, in the Youth Opportunity Program um, and in just about anything else I can do to help them, how we find ourselves at that point. So those years of um, kind of uh, negative interactions with the police as a, uh, a youth offender, um, an adult, young adult offender, um, and then finding myself in that place was all of the things that I brought to community mediation when I was asked if I could come. I was specifically asked to come it, um, to bring some young people. Uh, they call me the Pied Piper, the young people in Baltimore. Anywhere I go, they'll follow me. So I, call, I was called with the specific task of bringing some young people, and I came um, with a lot of preconceived notions about what this could be, couldn't be, uh, and not with a lot of hope and expectation that anything positive could come out. And I remember specifically there was one time that we came to the meeting and I was just kind of frustrated. And that frustration came to a head. I found myself in tears right there. Um, I'm a shameless cry. I'll cry right now. I don't care what y'all think. <laughs> because the crying was a lot better than the violent outburst that I had when I was a kid. And I found myself crying in front of Zach and other people, and I'm like, look, are we going to really do this for real? Are we going to continue to sit here? And Ganesha Martin, one of our um, team members in our particular circle, she was there. She got upset. She started crying. And then I got cussed out in Russian. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. That was Zach's friend, by the way. He brought her to the meeting. Um, but that day was a breaking. It was a breaking that brought a sense of reality to um, that whole meeting that transformed us from a group of people that came together to have a conversation to a group of people that have become family. Zach Novak is my brother. Officer Hassan is my brother. Officer Koo is my brother. Um, I'm trying to tell you that I, even as an adult, on the side of righteousness, trying to make a difference in my city, bore a lot of resentment and animosity towards people that wore the Baltimore City Police Department uniform. And these wonderful people, Shante and, and Tracy, um, um, yeah, um, <laughs> Tracy, um, Changa, and the community mediation group and their ability to kind of facilitate um, the conversation, create the dialogue, and give us the space. I, I, I've been a mediator kind of in a different way, but I've never um, kind of seen this kind of organized thing where they kind of set the table for you to be able to keep it a stack. They don't say keep it 100 no more. Oh, right, right. They keep it a stack. <laughs> <laughs> they keep it real, but in setting that and facilitating that dialogue, it allowed everybody to bring their truth, whatever that was, to the table. And that truth coming to the table transformed lives and relationships such that our last meeting was this past Monday um, under the mandated 16 hours or whatever it was. But we're meeting on the 6th in my office because we come too far in the conversation to stop now. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, these are my outreach team. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm an employment advocate for young people in Baltimore. I work for the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. And I get phone calls from Officer Novak and Officer Hassan. Hey, I encountered a young man who's on the wrong path. But rather than locking him up and putting charges on him, I'm going to send them to you. Um, I'm a little emotional right now because that kind of change 
is giving me a hope that I had didn't have prior to this process. Um, I'm crazy enough and passionate enough that I ran myself out in the middle of a riot and people thought I had lost my mind. But I love people and I love my city so much that it was my passion that drove me into that place. So to be able to see the change and the transformation that we've been able to achieve, it has given me such a hope for things that I always wanted to see and never quite knew how it would happen. This guy right here, Officer Hassan, Officer Cool, Officer Cool, they changed my mind about Baltimore City Police. They changed my mind about police, period. Um, and changed it for the best. Wonderful human beings are what I see when I look at these guys now. And for me, I'm 40 years old. It took me 40 years to come to that point where I could look at a police officer and see anything other than his badge and his uniform. I'm grateful to community mediation um, because this has been life changing for me. Not just something that I participated in or something to do. It's been literally life changing for me. I'm a father. I, I can transform, transfer that information down to my children <laughs> and to the young people. There's a young man, and I'm going to wrap it up, who was a part of the conversation when I first came. He's dear to my heart. I cried in the meeting over him too because he kind of disappeared from us and wasn't coming. Um, who had more than one interaction with um, Officer Hassan and some of the Western different District officers in the process of our mediation. And I'm talking, they on the street, he going back and he's reverting to things that we thought we had drew him away from. Um, he has become the poster child for what we hope is possible. I got a phone call from Officer Hassan. This is what we've seen. Before I go and do what my job gives me the power to do, I know we're in a different place, so you go get him. Went and got him. What I can tell you is, the last three meetings since his hiatus of about two meetings, he's been back with us, cur cur courageous enough to come and face these police officers that he thought he wanted to get back into the cat and mouse with. This is that hope um, that I'll never have to stand in between um, our police officers and our citizens again, that we'll all be able to stand together. Tracy asked us, did we want to stand up here together tonight? I wouldn't have it any other way. I love you, man. Sure enough, they said, you're going to feel like you don't want to go anymore after that one, after that incident happens. 
and it's going to happen. But I promise you the most progress will be made after that one. And damn it, she wasn't right because the meeting right after that, I feel like we had her. I want to give a shout out to all the mediators because there's a lot of times. It, And then you would see the question that you would start off the uh, meeting with. You're sitting there, you're reading, you're like, God, I gotta come up with something good by the time this circle comes around to me. <laughs> I don't wanna sound like an idiot. <laughs> Unless you're the person who immediately has to start in the years off the call. Uh, and they, they would challenge you because these weren't easy questions. And you were with people who might have been diametrically opposed to whatever your, your viewpoint was, but there was always an attitude of respect that you were going to challenge yourself to see it in a different way. And I think that maintaining that uh, air of respect throughout the process is what led us to that ultimate uh, policy that we're hopefully going to implement. And I'm a big, big, big believer in it because I believe in guys like Marvin who are going to help make it work. Um, and the only other thing I just want to end on is that mediation was great. It was a great experience for me as a police officer. Uh, I'm going to hopefully be an ambassador to it, to my other police officers, but the only way that this process works is if it continues to work, because we have to keep going with it, we have to pass it on. It can't just end with one 16-hour session, because that's all it would ever be is one 16-hour session. It has to be an ongoing dialogue so that other officers who I work with get to meet the other Marvins of their communities, and that's when I think real change is going to happen. Uh, and I'm going to end on that one. <laughs> of you for joining us tonight to share it with us. It reminds us why we do this work. Oh, I gotta see where I was. See, you threw me off. Um, so I, this is an important story and as they're talking about carrying on their work and the conversations in Baltimore City, um, part of what Community Mediation Maryland continues to do is to work to support the capacity building for individual centers in police community dialogues, um, but we're also working to integrate it into public policy. And so over the last year, Community Mediation Maryland worked with a task force on public safety and policing, which recommended the development uh, and expansion of police complaint mediation programs across the state. And the recommendation was included in the subsequent legislation that passed the Maryland General Assembly. And so now we're looking forward to working with the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission to develop best practices for police complaint mediation and to implement it in jurisdictions across the entire state. So we're very excited about that. 